Now, this panel, you know, given that we are a university, we work, of course, by definition with young people. So we can't have a thought leadership series and not talk about the youth. And that is what this specific panel will do. So the previous panel focused more in general, but this panel will, 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 will look at youth. And for, for, for that purpose, we, we gathered uh, three quite impressive people, I think. Um, you will see Ms. Mariana Eskander, she's from Harambi. And Harambi is an amazing initiative that runs in Joburg and I think also in Rwanda these days. Oh, uh, yes, and uh, so, so, so they, they look at matching young people up with better jobs, they help them with interview skills and, and, and all sorts of things. And I'm going to leave it to Mariana to tell you about that. She's the CEO of Harambi. Um, then we have uh, David Abbey. Now, David Abbey is a banker in, uh, at Rand Merchant Bank. He's a principal investments uh, a specialist there in leveraged finance. That is his thing. Um, he is also a UFS council member and alumnus from this university. And he was the youngest strategist and executive assistant to the CFO of RMB. Uh, and they poached him. Is it from PricewaterhouseCoopers that they? Yeah. So, so. Um, so, uh, and then next to me is Professor Bronilda Nene. She is our head of department at the Department of Business Management. Um, she had a PhD on the impact of entrepreneurial characteristics and lessons uh, that we could learn from that uh, for the survival, the long run survival of small and medium enterprises. Um, so, so, that was a, a very impressive piece of work. Um, so that is our panel, and uh, Max, all over to you. Thank you. Can we give? If, 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 just hand the microphone. Uh, can we start with you and go down the line and get your first uh, a few thoughts? Good afternoon, everyone. And um, someone asked the question: Where are all the youths? Because I think this session is meant for them. <laughs> Can I please have my slides on? <laughs> I think why I'm waiting for my slides to come on, I think when you look at South Africa at this point in time, we see that 35.7% of, of the population comprises of youths. And with these youths, what is important to find out is the fact that if you look at the first quarter report of 2019 in terms of unemployment, actually 55.2% of them are unemployed. And so when we look at entrepreneurship, they've been talking about job creation, but now I want to link entrepreneurship to job creation. So with a high rate of unemployment, you see that one possible option is starting a business. Can you move to the next slide, please? So what is it we need to know about South it's Africa and with respect to the youth? Before I get into it, I think that my focus was on entrepreneurship and the youth. Then I had to talk about the issue of gender. So I decided to break down this presentation in three points. Firstly, I want to talk about how do we foster youth entrepreneurship in South Africa. Then the second thing I want to talk about how do we transform the education system to be able to create more entrepreneurs. Then lastly, when we talk about providing support, what role does gender play? Just taking you back to what I said earlier on, I think we all know that unemployment with respect to youth stands at 55.2%. And now we're saying entrepreneurship is the way forward. But what then do we know about youth entrepreneurship in South Africa? What we know is the fact that they have a low entrepreneurial intentions. Actually, last year, the GEM report said that there was a slight increase from 10.1% from to 11.8%. But when you look at the, de the decline all over the years, you realize that it's still very low. Then when you look at the T, the T is actually the total early state entrepreneurial activity. South Africa currently stands at 11.1%, but if you look at, you compare them to that of efficient driven economies, what do you see? You see that they are still lacking because it's 16.4%. I looked at the UFS exit report. It showed that the youth in South Africa, or the graduates do not want at the free state to be entrepreneurs, specifically 1% of them came from the EMS faculty. Two from law, three from the health, and I think also three from nurse. 
And that tells you that what? There's a high rate of unemployment, but people still do not want to start a business. I looked at a study that was done at WITS, and it was Boris Oban happened to have been the study leader, where the sampled 936, 837 students across universities within South Africa, and they found out that students would rather stay home and look for a job as opposed to starting a business. Then lastly, I did a study year across EMS students, and I found out that their career path is firstly the hybrid, the full-time employment, then the self-employment. With that in mind, what do we do? Now I decided to go back to what has been done with respect to literature. In South Africa and in the rest of the developing countries, a lot of emphasis has been placed on intentions, the formation of intentions. And you've been doing it using entrepreneurship education. And I'm saying that true. Intentions actually, or entrepreneurship education will enhance intentions. But we all know that, and I move to the second part. Intentions do not translate to actual behavior. In fact, studies are saying that intentions only explain 30% of the variance to subsequent behavior. And when you have that in mind, it means that we need to start closing the intentions behavior gap. So how do we close it? It's where we are and what we need to do as a country. Then the last part is the issue of the performance versus the growth. Depending on whatever report you read, it shows that between 70, 70 to 80% of businesses are failing within the first five years. And the most recent Standard Bank report said that 50% of startups do not go past the second year. So you can see that there's a high failure rate among the businesses. So now, how do we foster youth entrepreneurship? I don't want to begin with the part of formation of intentions because a lot of, in fact, everyone is doing it. What I want to lay emphasis on, it's now on the intention behavior gap. So how do we close that gap? Firstly, I talk about the culture and the social norms. If you look at the GEM report 2017-2018, it, it says that in terms of the culture, South Africa was ranked 34 out of 54. So you can see that we don't have a culture to start a business. Even the people themselves who are entrepreneurs tell their kids to go look for a job. So how do you go about changing the culture and the social norms? So we need to start branding entrepreneurship as a respectable career path. Secondly, we need to do, we need to en ensure that businesses give their employees time to start a business. Recently in Sweden, we see that businesses actually give their employees six months off to go start a business. So I think that is something that we need to start doing. And thirdly, the family plays a great role in terms of the youth social behavior. So we need to bring the families on board, we need to bring the communities on board if we want to see the youths to start creating their own businesses. Then the second thing we have to talk about is about the entrepreneurial traits they need, and we link it to the fear and doubt. And again, if you look at the GEM report 2017-2018, it says that South Africa was ranked 38 out of 54. So it tells us that what? We need to start teaching these people about resilience, about personality, pro proactive personality, about greed, and there are so many things we need to teach them on how to be resilient. Then the last thing is the role of an entrepreneurial university. And I look, for example, UFS happens to be one of them. What do we need to do? We need to provide resources for startups. And when I talk about resources, what do I mean? I want to see physical, I want to see information, I want to see human capital, and I want to see financial. Then we also need to provide entrepreneurship education. And I'm going to be touching more on that when I go to the recommendations on how to transform the education system. Then we need to provide funding, and I talk about maybe bringing in venture capitalists, angel investors. Then evidence-based entrepreneurship. All the researchers on entrepreneurship, this is time that you need to go and do your homework. You, everything has to be grounded in research, because the only way we can fix it is to see what are the best practices we can learn from around the world. How do we bring it in here? Then with respect to the issue of performance versus growth, I identified three types of mechanisms through which we could use it. And the first one talks about the buffering mechanisms. And if I listen to the president's speech, there's so much emphasis on incubation mentorship. That is what is already being done. And I think that I have to reiterate that that is what is needed. But then we have to think about the quality of those programs. Then secondly, we talk about the bridging. And with respect to the bridging, is about exposing the youth to external stakeholders. And maybe talk about governments, and with government, I'll talk about positive discrimination, ensuring that they get contracts. Then the boosting mechanism, where I'll lay emphasis on the organizational 
capabilities and more I'll talk about how do you teach these businesses to grow and the emphasis is going to be maybe on internal and external growth methods and I'll give an example of internal we can talk about alliance partnership collaborations and there's so much to learn from the Pakistanis you can see those are one of the people in South Africa today their businesses are bent down tomorrow you see that the start back what is it about them that we need to learn I think that that is something that we as the youth we need to start learning from them then again when you talk about external growth methods we talk about we talk about venture we talk about mergers and acquisition and joint venture that is something that I'll encourage if we want to see the businesses growing but then again I say that for this to happen not everyone has to be selected we need to ensure that we have to apply the selecting the winner strategy to ensure that we only get the best and the best is people who have the intentions to actually grow and how do you select them you have to lay emphasis on people who have the growth motivation and lastly, you have to ensure that the set milestones targets. And there has to be aspects of monitoring and evaluation if you want to see those businesses thrive. So now, how then do you transform the education system? I looked at best practices around the world and I came to a conclusion that we need to have a mixture of both theory and practice. And I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be giving examples, and we ensure that we focus on different target markets. And when I talk about the different target markets, I begin with the students. Within the students, we have people who have def defined themselves as different entrepreneurial life cycle. So we have to ensure that we provide different type of support to them. Then you also have the entrepreneurship academics and researchers. Then you have the regional and, the gov and national government. Then businesses of all types and size. Then again, I go back to the issue of research because sometimes when you look at the studies that has been done in South Africa, there's still a lot lacking in terms of research on entrepreneurship. Everyone focuses on intentions, but they are not bridging the gap between intentions and actual behavior. And now I'm going to give you examples of specifically what exactly the program should be focusing on. If you look at the University of Utah in the US, they have a program or they focus on the business generation model. And that is an introductory course where they ensure that students take up their entrepreneurial initiative from ideation to proof of concept to sales to production. That is something that we need to focus on. And now and again, you have to ensure that it focuses on a specific target market and not everyone. Then the process focus approach. This is something that is being used at the University of North Carolina. And now with the focus process model or approach, what does it talk about? It says that, and the focus of this is on nascent entrepreneurs. Specifically, we know that entrepreneurship, it's, or studies have proven that the best entrepreneurs are people who have failed time and again. So people who are interested in starting a business. So if I go back to the UFS exit report, that 1% in the EMS faculty, those are the people that we need to ensure that this focuses on them. Where we teach them about resilience, we teach them about how to survive the journey. Of, an, of, of success and failure. How do you rise when you fail? Then we look at the, the method world model. The method world model comes from the University of, is it, I think, Britain in, in the UK. And the way they teach people about simulations and serious games. So we need to ensure that, again, we give that to the entrepreneurs. Then you have the training of the trainers. A lot of studies have shown that the success of the entrepreneurship program depends on the quality of the educators. So we need to teach them about the best practices on how to teach entrepreneurship. Then gender, the last thing I would like to talk about is the issue of gender with respect to entrepreneurship. Over the last few decades, we see that women entrepreneurs have been, they've been on the rise. But however, when you compare them to their male counterparts, what do you find? You find out that they're still declining. In terms of intention-wise, you see that a lot of them have the intentions to start your business, but then the, the gap is, those intentions are never translated to actual behavior. What again exactly do we know about the women entrepreneurs? We know that firstly, their businesses are closely interlinked to their families, which means that whatever solutions you come up with, you have to ensure that it links to the families. So now, if you want to provide solutions to enhancing women entrepreneurs, specifically within the youth, what exactly should policy focus on? Firstly, I talk about using the family context as a source of enrichment. With the women entrepreneurs, you see that they, are, they end up being multitasking. They are the women, they are the mother, they are the wife, they have everything. So those dual roles create a lot of conflict. So they end up with the family to work conflict and every other thing. Finding the balance becomes a problem. So you need to ensure that you provide support. And the support now could come from the family domain. And I'll give an example. In terms of instrumental support, in terms of emotional support, in terms of financial support. 
And then the government also has a role to play in, in that. Then again, you talk about they developing self-regulation skills, which is, I think, it's something that the women also will have to learn about how to become resilient when they are managing the dual roles they all have. Then lastly, I talk about the strength-based mentoring approach, and that is something that is currently being done in, in Europe, where the, 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 the mentors teach the mentees on how to identify their strengths, and using your strengths to be able to grow your businesses. So as a strategy, and again, I have something I say here. I say presently, more research needs to be done when it comes to women entrepreneurship. When I look at policies on the government, they focus on entrepreneurs and the focus on the youth entrepreneurs, but there's no focus on women entrepreneurs. And I think that all the women sitting here, we all have our own challenges that are very unique to us. And I think that it's time that we spend time on research if we want to see things change. So when I look at everything that I've said today, I think that I'm advocating for education in terms of transformation, but the quality. And we have to talk about specific, in, in terms of the education, I have to say it has to be tailor-made. You're not offering to everyone. You're offering to specific groups of target market. So if you want to see change in terms of youth entrepreneurship, you have to ensure that the type of education you offer is tailored made to specific target markets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nene. Uh, Mariana, I think you're next. Thank you. Is it on? Oh. <laughs> is everybody awake? Yes. Fantastic. It's often at these events, old people talking about young people to young people. So I want to try to just share a little bit about what Harambee Youth Employment Accelerator is, and then just maybe try to tell three stories that I hope will connect uh, for those of you who, who were here, some of the conversations earlier this morning about what we need in terms of growing our economy, and then try to share reflections from the work that we've done on some of the challenges of entrepreneurship, I think picking up on, on your very good points. Um, Harambee is exactly its title. We're a youth employment accelerator. It was founded about eight years ago in a partnership with the private sector, uh, founding businesses including Hollard and Nando's and others that wanted to think about a solution uh, to tackle youth employment beyond just their own firms, um, working at that time with the National Treasury um, and trying to say what are the pragmatic things that can be done in this generation to tackle some of the um, challenges of youth unemployment while we agree that many other things need to get done, the education system certainly being um, one of those challenges. We started with 40 young people and five businesses. Um, we have now worked with 500 uh, private sector companies. We've placed about 125,000 young South Africans in either uh, a job or a work experience and collected a significant amount of data about what some of the real challenges are, again, at a very pragmatic and practical level, which is what I hope I can share uh, some of those lessons learned with you today. I think that the first uh, answer always is that we need more growth. So I think let's just bank that and agree that, that uh, if we can grow ourselves out of the economic um, challenges that we have, we can all agree that that's a good answer. That does require deep partnership by the private sector and by government. And just to give one simple story, we started working in a sector, the global business services sector. This is um, predominantly call centers, but higher end work as well. We compete globally with many other countries to bring foreign direct investment to South Africa. And we have many advantages in this particular sector, one of them being a predominantly matriculant population that is English speaking. If I just give as an example, the Philippines has about the same same number of English-speaking matriculants of South Africa on an annual basis. They've created 1.3 million jobs in the sector. We've created 50,000 jobs in the sector. So when we look at opportunity for growth and opportunity certainly to bring more foreign direct investment for jobs that young people can see as a starting point into career, it's a very attractive sector. Over many years of working in that sector, we worked with the industry body, we worked with government, and particularly the Department of Trade and Industry, and just a few months ago have reached an agreement that we think can double the size of the sector, meaning add another 50,000 new jobs over the next five years with like very clear actionable things that everybody needs to do. I know 50,000 net new jobs in the scheme of 9 million is not the full answer, but I do think that there are many things we can look to as a way of saying net new jobs can be created, it can be done, and we have to focus on where we have comparative advantages, and that those jobs can produce um, work for young people. I would actually say that's a critical filter um, in, in, in figuring out where to go. The second thing that we do is we try to partner with businesses about how they think differently 
in their hiring. And I just want to give two examples, and some of this I think builds off the points that you made. So as I said, we work with about 500 South African corporates. How many of them do you think make you take a math test for the job, if you had to guess? Percentage, 80%, anybody else? Okay, I got 80% over here, anybody else want to guess? Zero, okay, 99%. Now, I just want to unpack that just for a moment, because if we think about what the test is intended to do for many employers, if you ask them, why do you give a math test? So I'll ask you, why do you give a math test? Typically, what they will say is they're trying to test for problem-solving skills. They're trying to test for logical processing. Is the test measuring those things? Almost never, right? Because what the test typically is measuring is the quality of whoever taught you percentages or fractions or multiplication or whatever. And as we know from my colleague here, probably pretty poor if you've come through the South African schooling system. So instead, we said, why don't we actually try to measure what you want, which is somebody who can do problem solving and logical processing. And we went into the market and settled on a learning potential test. What it measures is can you see new information that's unfamiliar to you, predict patterns, be able to process what's likely to come next. The test, importantly, is a symbols-based test because one of the most important findings from our work is that oftentimes young people struggle in a math test because of English, because of the questions in English, not because there's any challenge in understanding the actual numerical concepts. When we did that and we compared the two, the percent of young people who were eligible for the jobs that we had because of their learning potential was close to 90%. The number of them who passed the math test at a matric level, and many of them were post-matric because they had finished matric, 28%. Okay, so you're saying as a, an employer, I've now eliminated a huge amount of the workforce because I'm not understanding how to measure what it is I'm looking for in the performance of the job. And so by just working to change how we open up the pipelines to let talent that exists everywhere in South Africa, that I can promise you, the talent to do the work exists. But how do we find ways, I think, to think differently about this idea of skills and to think differently about what's required? I mean, if those of you who saw Apple and Google have now said they no longer require college degrees for any jobs in their organizations, and on Saturday in Cape Town, one of our partners, uh, Explore Data Science Academy, graduated 78 young people that are going to go into junior data scientist jobs. None of them have a university degree. So we do have to think differently about what these pathways are going to be um, into employment. My last, my last point, which touches on entrepreneurship, is I think carefully taking my cue from the earlier panel about telling the truth, so I'll say carefully. Um, I think the real challenge is that in many respects, people, um, and certainly I would say some of our political leaders, say entrepreneurship when they don't know how to say there's not enough jobs. Because the reality is you have to take entrepreneurship and divide it up. There are young people who genuinely can ideate new things and be the next Steve Jobs, and we should absolutely encourage that, and it's classic entrepreneurship. Most of the research shows that those people are likely to succeed if they've had prior work experience. It's very difficult to go from zero work experience to ideating something that is going to lead you to be that kind of an entrepreneur. What we need to talk about is that most jobs, both here and across the world, no longer have employers. So what does self-employment look like in this next generation? What does it mean to have to think about how you're going to manage for yourself without a traditional employer? People say entrepreneurship, but that's not entrepreneurship. And I think that that's the place where some of the deciding what it means to say, I have to be on a pathway for either self-employment or I have to think practically about what it is I can do to start earning in whatever ways that add things up and then move and, and, and transfer that into the formal economy. So I'll just end with that, I think, to say that um, I hope in some of the discussion we can really talk about why we need different pathways to get young people into the economy because I think a lot of these ideas are, um, they're correct, but they're, they're kind of blunt instruments and I think that, that that's what's going to need some unpacking. Um, thank you. Can I keep your microphone? I'm breaking the pattern, but something that came up to me when you spoke was the question, does a young person need a certain personality type to be a good entrepreneur? 
So we at Harambee use something called an employability map that looks at five factors that help us determine the answer to that question. And it's not personality type, well, we, we say that it is a combination of, some of it's about your sociodemographic attributes. Sometimes where you live matters more than anything else. Sometimes it's behavioral. So behavioral would be, for example, do I have voluntary agency, which is one of the assessments we use to say, yeah. does somebody get up and make things happen when nothing's happening? And how do you begin to test and understand that? But the thing, Max, I think people don't actually pay enough attention to is what we call socialization, which is if you've only understood and been trained to work, for example, in like a large environment with lots and lots of people, and now you're on your own, you have no idea how to cope on your own. So the socialization matters. So those are the kinds of attributes that I would say, definitely say, is somebody more prone to the extent that entrepreneurship is making something. Absolutely, there's ways to, to measure for that. Thank you very much. It's time for the banker to speak. <laughs> um, thank you. So interestingly, my uh, presentation, and apologies, I've deviated a bit from the, from the norm, just in the theme of the topic. Um, and um, so my, my presentation is kind of dominated by technology. And unfortunately, um, I was meant to be standing here with an iPad in my hand, um, kind, of, um, kind of going through the presentation, but technology failed. So I had to kind of fail safe. <laughs> so I guess. Technology intervention can be either positive or negative, so that's a lesson. Um, so um, thank you, I'm David Abbey, and I'm pleased to kind of share about the world of work tomorrow. Um, could I get the clicker, yes, please? Thank you. Okay, so in order to determine the world of work tomorrow, it is necessary to look at kind of what the world could possibly look like tomorrow. Dramatic shifts in the world currently are impacted by technology, data, demographic shifts, economic shifts, and the need for higher levels of productivity. Technology is seen as the most radical driver of change, from artificial intelligence and robotic processing to digital mobility and virtual collaboration. Of course, it is very difficult to contemplate this future when we can't really define what this future really is. Now, many, many pundits and many analysts agree that the workplace changes are definitely inevitable. And many futurists appear to try and reach consensus about whether what the advances could look like in 10 years' time and whether robots will really take our jobs. So now I stumbled across this website, which basically is, will robots take my job? And I'd like to have a one minute practical demonstration of which jobs is predicted um, for robots to take. So perhaps if we could start with um, lawyers, for instance. Are there any lawyers in the room? Okay, let's see if your job's at risk. Four percent. Okay, should we try accountant? So I'm a chartered accountant um, that will look at the broader accounting field and see whether the job is at risk. But here's an interesting fact. Although lawyers are only four percent at risk, the projected growth by 2020 is only six percent. So that's what's interesting about, about this website. It tells you about the growth in a profession. So if we go to accounting, for, an, for example, Ninety-eight percent. Okay, so I mean, you can go through the website at your leisure and test your own professions and what you're trying to get into. If we flip back to the presentation, David, uh, will you do me a favor and type in academic? <laughs> <laughs> Should we try lecturer or academic or something along those lines? Okay, so we have teachers. Should we try lecturer or professor? Oh, yes. <laughs> it doesn't register. It doesn't register. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So I think. 
I think academics should either be worried or not worried at all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, David. Sure, okay. no problem. Okay, so it's quite clear that some jobs are indeed vulnerable to automation. Mobileye of Israel, which uh, is developing wireless vehicles. Um, we know that on the streets of California right now, the autonomous self-driving trucks that are long-haul trucks that are doing trips without drivers in them. Baidu, the Chinese tech giant, is working with King, King Long Motor Group of China to introduce autonomous buses in industrial parks. Now, the US has got long-haul trucks. China is making trucks that can drive in a city. Now, we know when the Chinese latch onto something, <laughs> it's definitely going to happen. Now, we saw that accountants are at risk, so financial analysts who spend much of their time conducting formula-based research are also experiencing shifts. Sherbank, the largest bank in the Russian Federation, relies on AI to make 35% of, of its loan decisions and anticipating raising this to 70% in less than five years. Robot lawyers have already replaced 3,000 human employees in Sherbank's legal department. The number of back office employees is expected to shrink by 90% in the next five years. Now, although it seems like we arm wrestling robots, and it's, a, and it's an understandable source of worry to those who think that their roles could become redundant in the next few years, this fear is typically tempered by the argument that the rise of technology and AI will in fact shift us from repetitive mundane tasks which computers can handle better. Let's be honest with ourselves in the spirit of honesty. Computers can handle those tasks better. Um, that shift will create untold opportunities for us. And although these will be different in shape, form and function, and it is believed that the jobs of tomorrow are unknown today. Now in determining the world of work tomorrow, we further need to take a closer look at understanding the world of work that has evolved over, over the past. Now there's talk of the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution spoke of the shift of humans relying on human strength and animals for production to mechanization. The second industrial revolution spoke to leveraging technology, I mean, not technology, apologies, electricity to increase production. The third industrial revolution spoke to wireless and wired communication to help enhance productivity. Now, the fourth industrial revolution talks to cyber human interaction to enable productivity into the future. Now, as you can see, kind of just based on the pictures there, we've moved from farming with our hands and mining and shifting coal with our hands to leveraging industrial technology that helps to expedite the process. Now, what is that shift? What did that cause? That caused us moving from working with our hands to working more with our brains and more working more with, uh, with aptitude, aptitude type learning for new technologies to help us to increase scale and to increase productivity. Now, this, this slide just basically summarizes that and, and the evolution it goes from working with our hands to working with our brains and I'll speak later about working with our heart. Not only are we evolving, but technology is also evolving. Ro the same robots that we're scared of stealing our jobs today are also evolving so that they can steal even more complex jobs tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so let's explore that. Let's explore the evolution of technology in the fourth industrial revolution that's going to cause a shift because we've all agreed well, I've agreed, and I've kind of agreed on your behalf, that technology, <laughs> that technology will be the biggest impact on our work, in, on our, not only on our, on our lives, on our everyday lives, but also on our work environment. Now, what does that mean? The rate of pace of adoption of technology and innovation 
is, is shortening at a rapid pace. Now, this graph is quite old. Now, this talks to years. The rate of adoption of technology has now gone from years to mere days. That is, is incredibly scary, and it's also incredibly exciting as to the possibilities. Now, if you look at the markets, and I, I kind of put this in just to show the shift in markets, not only, not only in what we do, but also how it translates to the global economy. In, in 1999, and this is just looking at it over, over, the, last, over the last 20 years, in 1999, we had the dot-com bubble, and the biggest companies in the world um, are listed are listed over the um, on the first on the first uh, uh, presentation. It was a mix of companies where you had General Electric, and you only had um, two or three technology firms on the list of the biggest companies. Through different events that happened, and that's why I said the world of work will be shaped by world events. Through different events that happened, we had the dot-com bubble in 1999. Post the dot-com post the, the, post the bubble, we had a diverse mix of companies. Um, in 2009, we had the financial crisis, uh, the financial crisis where the, the, the economy was then largely resource-based. So it was big oil companies, big um, resource uh, mining companies. In South Africa itself, our economy has gone from mining and resources being the number one um, contributor to GDP to now financial services. And um, we can talk about that uh, kind of the shift in the South African economy um, on its own. And we can sit here for hours talking about it. We then have kind of as, as, as resources then became more, more significant because the bigger, the more our production capacity, the more resources we need to produce. So big oil, um, and you can see AIG, Financial Services, Bank of America, everyone came onto the list um, because they were doing these big deals to really drive production. Uh, 2014, we then had the rise of, of, of tech. Um, or, but tech as we know it, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazon, and the like. Um, and in 2019, we've then gone from three tech companies to seven tech companies being the biggest in the world, to the point where Apple, the biggest, the biggest company on the US stock exchange is five and a half times bigger than the GDP of New Zealand. So, and, and there are many reasons for that. And this graph, for me, captures a great reason for it. So if you look at Walmart and Ikea, the two biggest retail companies in the world, they were started hundreds of years ago, multi-generational. Multi it, it took them decades and centuries to get to where they are today. You look at a company like Taobao.com, which is an online retailer. From 2003, it took it about 10 years to eclipse Walmart and Ikea as the biggest, online, as the biggest retailer to the point where it's carrying on growing. So in business school, they'll teach you about the S-curve principle. The S curve of, of most companies are shortening, and unless you're able to leverage the unless you're able to leverage technology and to create multiple S curves, Google is a is such an example where and what the S curve talks about and it and it's quite applicable to entrepreneurship is when you start a business, as you can see from that Taobao graph, you almost flatten out and actually you actually go backwards. That's the beginning of your S. And then as you gain traction, you then have a big neck and then essentially at some point you plateau, you, you flatten out. Um, now, if you're unable to reinvent yourself, you will flatten out and what does an S do? It comes back down, you'll go back down. Um, and that's what many companies like Nokia and Blackberry have experienced. Google did not experience that because they went from a, they went from a, 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 mail, a mail exchange, an online mail exchange to a search engine to, to, to an advertising company to now actually one of the front runners in developing driverless cars. And that's how they were able to then kind of um, have continuity. Um, so even tech companies themselves experience disruption. Um, so then what does that mean for us if I, if I go back? So responding to the changing nature of work, and this is where we all need to kind of pay careful attention. The effects of technology means that we have changing skills, 
new and new and adaptive business models. This raises a question of how can learners and students and workers of today ensure that they are prepared for the future work roles that, that we can't clearly yet define today? Unfortunately, there's no easy answer. There's also no denying that governments, universities, regulatory bodies, industry bodies, and employers have a vital role to play in, to, in helping today's students and workers to become tomorrow's thriving employees, managers, and leaders. So although robots may be doing much of the work and the concept of full-time employment for life, and will probably be will probably have somewhat archaic, the focus of the workplace should be should always be on people. More specifically, the focus will need to be on how best to equip and enable people to engage with technology to achieve these types of levels of results that we, can, we probably can't even contemplate. So now, one such example which I stumbled across was SICA, the, the, the kind of governing body of, a, of the CA association, is teaming up with universities such as UJ to prepare chartered accountants for the fourth industrial revolution by offering courses that, to, that, got, that enables them to prepare for what is to come. Now, um, we can identify that there are skills gaps, um, and the changing nature of firms coincides with the shift and the demand in skills. So there will be a shift in the demand in skills. Um, the demand will be for more advanced skills. Uh, the demand will be for, um, for, for people who are able to, who have multidisciplinary um, abilities to, 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 to tackle multidisciplinary tasks. So, um, social behavioral skills then become very important. So not only is the fo will the focus be on IQ, but will also be on EQ and SQ, because we'll be interacting more with each other socially, um, uh, which then enables produ uh, productivity. Um, and 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 w when we come to working with the heart, not only will will we be focusing on 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 productivity, but we are now more conscious of the impact on society. We're now more conscious on how we interact with each other. We're now more conscious on how we 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 relate to other people's um, belief systems, how we relate to other people's um, values and principles, and how we can co co coexist and work together for the good of the world and for the good of, of ourselves as well. Um, The future world of work will require a trusted society. So the worker will now need to be more trusted, uh, trustworthy. We know big corporate South Africa today is in big trouble. We hear about, about Tongart, EO8, Steinoff, and the like going down, a lot of which was dishonesty, trust. They lost, the, the, there was no trust in the relationship that they had with the market. And, and with the business that they did. So trust becomes an incredible element in society. Um, human skills, as I said, will have to develop. We'll have to develop beyond, beyond just kind of repetitive rote learning, but to, to actually saying, how do we enhance our skills to ensure we can leverage technology to, to provide more to, to the workplace? Well-being becomes important. Work-life balance becomes important, incredibly important. And Who's to say that the, work, uh, the workplace of the future has to be in a building? Um, who's to say that your employees, you actually have to have account of your employees? Who's to say there's not, there won't be an app of, of professionals who can, who can sell their services to, to organizations? Um, and, and that will require a lot of reskilling. Technology is going to be very disruptive, but it will also become a productive process in the future world of work. Um, so, so in conclusion, um, I mean, the question is no longer um, kind of if or when the workplace will be transformed. The workplace is currently transforming. Investec took the, took the decision to do away with leave, leave days and to do away with a strict code of, 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 of dressing. Um, and that is a shift. And that requires trust, and that requires a labor force or a workforce that is, that is self-sufficient and is able to, to guide themselves as opposed to be guided by, by the organization. Um, people understand that boring, repetitive tasks will be done by robots, and that workers whose jobs will disappear will need to learn new skills. Um, 
Silicon Valley did not exist um, two decades ago, but now it's one of the biggest employers in the US. Um, so with disruption and with, um, uh, with the kind of the jobs that are being taken away, there will also be jobs being created. And as we know, the future, the future workplace of tomorrow is undefined, and it's, and it's up to us through our learning process and our adaptation process to ensure that we, we equip ourselves with the requisite skills to be able to respond to that. So just lastly, I'd like to just take you through this, this uh, pictogram quickly. This just talks to our everyday needs in life. Um, and there's a phrase that's being coined now that says there's an app for everything. And this talks to the gig culture. Now, when we talk to entrepreneurship and everything else, um, now not only, do you, not only are you now looking to get into formal employment after graduation or to look to kind of start a business, a bricks and mortar business, but there's apps that do absolutely everything in life um, that we need today. Now, what role are we playing? This is led by Silicon Valley. What role is the entrepreneur in South Africa playing or the youngsters in universities playing today? Um, and what role is the university playing to make sure everyone's ready for a world like this where what you will do after studying is not defined yet? You have the power to define it yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> Before we start talking among ourselves and Frontier, I want to go to the audience and say, who has a question or a, a statement to make that we can react to? There's one here with the red, and then there's one there, and then one here. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is with regards to, oh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, it's with regards to the spirit, the spirit of an entrepreneur. Because we, we have in a culture of young people being too dependable. How is it that we change the mindset and the psychology of being too dependable and the spirit of teachability, because I understand that as entrepreneurs, we solve problems and we make profit out of solving problems. I, for one, is an entrepreneur. Um, we have skilled, I, I get an impression that it, it, even in varsities, we get people that are smart and intelligent, but we, we, get, we get overtaken by fear and the, the, two, the dependability from the government or the state. Hence, you, uh, Prof. Nene is having, uh, uh, what is this, um, a research that says, even the business students are, are not willing to start businesses. It's sad. How is it that we, we, we shift from saying that the future is unknown to everyone and nothing in this world is ever certain? I think the free spirit of entrepreneur can say, how is it that I come with uh, identify problems and come up with solutions to these problems. And I understand that in the process, I might go through suffering. It's okay, it, it, it's, it's for a cause. How do we shift to that mindset of dependability and fear and thinking of when I, come, when I go from varsity, I go to work. I don't wanna struggle because I, 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 I graduated. Two, saying there's more problems in this society I can be a solution to that, and I can bring a solution that will supersede my existence. Okay. How do we, as people, get young people from that thinking to that thinking? Because Let's I understand that um, entrepreneurs are free spirit people. So. Let's get a response, Professor Nena. You want the truth? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take them to the other side of Africa. That's the first thing you need to do, because there, you don't depend on the government. It's survival of the fittest. That's what happens that side. But on second thought, I'm going to say that we have to focus on the hybrid, hybrid entrepreneurship. 
it's a combination of self-employment and full-time employment. And my study has proven, and other studies across the world has proven that when you, be, when you begin to say you're a hybrid entrepreneur, you have a full-time job and then you switch. The survival rate is very high and failure is low. Then the issue of fear and doubt has been eliminated. And that is something that I picked among the UFS students, especially within the EMS faculty. They want to be hybrid. So, and that is why you see I'm saying we need to replicate the model of Sweden. The youths are between the ages of 14 and 35. Some of them already have jobs. So now we must tell all the employers, give them a day or oh, two months to go start a business. Then we must also encourage the spirit of entrepreneurship. It's about coming up with ideas, collaboration. And that is something that I have to say it very loud. We don't have it. Even in class, you see students. Tell them, you tell them about a the group assignment. They tell you, I don't know anyone in class. We need to learn to collaborate because with that idea, the fact that we have complementary skills, I come with something different, you come with another one. By the time we pull together, we can create something. So I feel that if you want to change that spirit, I think hybrid entrepreneurship is the direction to go. But I also feel that changing the context in which you come. We have parents who will tell you they are entrepreneurs. I've seen it over time. They'll tell you, I am an entrepreneur, but I want you to go get a full-time job. And just last week, there was a research published in the Business Tech that said that the, the, the richest South Africans, what did they study? It came out to be law, finance, economics. And I've often asked students, why would you want to be a lawyer? They tell you the likes of the president and everyone did something like law. So you can see that without mindset, we, the parents, will have to change the mindset. So, and the employers too also have to give your parts to see. And I think that policy too should also speak to the issue of, of hybrid entrepreneurs, wherein if people come with good ideas in the company, how do you make it their own? I think that that could also fix the problem because the issue of fear, the ba entrepreneurial background, some of you too come from, from, I think, from places where your parents own businesses, but they don't teach you about the business. So we can't take it as a context by context. And I think we also need to bring in the youths who actually own businesses. What is it about them? We need to start unpacking their own stories. What is it about them that they have, that the ones who are afraid don't have? What is it about them we can learn to teach the others? Because then I think it's a way of addressing the issue of fear and doubt. Marina, do you have a thought or should we go on to another question? Um, the next question was over there. And to all the panelists, thank you so much for uh, it's a very insightful your discussion. I must, I must maybe just give some background on myself, just to put my, my comments into perspective. My name is Dani Jacobs, and I'm the founder of a company called Young Entrepreneurs, as well as the Young Entrepreneurs Foundation. So we, we train about 10,000 children on a yearly basis on entrepreneurship, financial literacy, employability, and workplace readiness. And the reason I founded the company, I was always had this conundrum in terms of we've been teaching entrepreneurship for many years, but given that we still do not have an entrepreneurial culture in this country and entrepreneurship is not being promoted as an attractive career option. And it, I was always, it was always mind-boggling why. And when I think about entrepreneurship education in this country, Einstein's definition of insanity comes to mind. How can we expect different results if we do the same thing all over again. I want to highlight four fundamental flaws in terms of what we are busy with. We get the packaging wrong. We are teaching business acumen and we think we are teaching entrepreneurship. The entrepreneurial mindset is installed through repetitive experiential exposure from a very young age. Children are born with a very natural entrepreneurial mindedness, spirit, and intent. They love making things. They love playing shop shop. They are creative. If we leave it and we don't empower them, that entrepreneurial mindedness, spirit, and intent dwindles. And by the time they get to high school or, or actually to matric, it's almost non-existent. So by shoving business acumen down their throats will not make them entrepreneurs. They might end up as good business managers, but not entrepreneurs. You must need to understand the entrepreneurial mindset attributes. That also links to the second flaw, and I refer to this as the constitutional flaw. Our focus in this country is on youth development. Youth being defined between those, that's between 18 and 35. We leave it too late. If you end up in the entrepreneurship development 
uh, an entrepreneurship development program after school. You sit there out of necessity and not out of choice. You sit there because you are unemployed, you can't further your studies, or you're an unemployed graduate. That's just how it is. Then we need to redefine business. And one of the speakers, I think Mariana spoke about self-employment. Now our programs range, just to give you an idea, on the, on the one side of the spectrum we've got Tinypreneurs, a puppet show for kids ages four to six. On the other side of the spectrum we've got a launchpad program where we actually install fourth industrial revolution skills to help students engage into the freelance or the gig economy. We need to redefine business. The business of one, the self-employed, that's business. And you need to recognize the freelance economy. And then my last flaw is in terms of the mindset. This country, our youth has got, they are entitled. They are driven by instant gratification. We are plagued with a scapegoat mentality. And the social ground system is not doing ourselves any favors. That was, um, <laughs> that's very helpful. Could I respond to that? Um, yes, there's a quick response here and then I'm coming to you, sir. Thank you, and thanks for the insights. I fully agree with all your points. So when it comes to, I guess, specifically entrepreneurship, um, it becomes very important, and in anything actually, um, whether it's in entrepreneurship or formal employment or whatever, it becomes very important to understand what the cogs in the wheel are. So if, if firstly, you need an, en an enabling environment. Without an enabling environment, nothing will thrive. You can be the smartest person in a workplace. If you're not enabled to do what you do and to do it well, you will not, be, you will not succeed. Now, if the environment of South Africa is not conducive to an entrepreneur, how will even the best entrepreneur um, kind of be successful? So I'll give you an example. If I, as an entrepreneur, decide I want to start selling bottles of water, um, and there isn't a way for me, I can have the best bottle of water, it can taste like diamonds. It's tasteless, same thing, same as water. <laughs> um, and I have no one to sell it to, I'll be a failure as an entrepreneur. Uh, regardless of how good my business model is and everything. Secondly, um, so how can we fix that? The government can focus on enabling programs. So they currently are. So you can incentivize corporates to have, to have incubation hubs, um, to have kind of entrepreneurship hubs. So you have um, RMH, for instance, which has AlphaCode. And what AlphaCode does is, I'll give you free space, because if you're an entrepreneur, it's expensive. Your S-curve starts with you dipping down. You are wasting, you're not wasting resources, but you're investing in, in productivity. You're paying for rental space. You're paying for electricity. You have to get your own internet infrastructure. You have to get all of that. It's expensive. If you cannot fund that, you will not be a success. That's the first part. So there's the, the, uh, there's the, there's the, um, there's, there's the Endeavor program, for instance, which says not only will I help you develop your product on, but I'll actually link you up with people who, you, who can open markets and channels for you to actually sell your product. Without that, you, will be, you, you could be a failure because, so for example, this bottle of water here is bottled by Coca-Cola. Someone makes their plastic bottles. Um, why, and, and this is a challenge to the entrepreneur, why would Coca-Cola want to choose you over this person who's already been providing to them or want to broaden their base to say, okay, I will be able to um, bring you into the fray as, as a producer into my, into my system. And that's what talks to the previous panel discussion is that we need economic growth firstly. With economic growth, we can fuel entrepreneurship. We can fuel additional productivity. Um, without that, you are now eating into your pie. The size of your pie is the same. You're now wanting to slice it smaller. And there's going to be a lot of resistance to that. So you need an enabling environment. Um, you need enabling infrastructure. So when it comes to the grant system, what I would do as government is to actually incentivize corporates because it, it's a, it's a public-private partnership. Incentivize corporates, give them tax breaks to enable entrepreneurs to thrive and to, and to innovate. So an example, discovery, insurance. Those are amongst the biggest companies in South Africa. They were started at RMB, right? And there's many other businesses as well that, that came out of, that have come out of RMB and are still within RMB or within the first strand group. And, and, and without that enabling environment, it becomes difficult for even the best entrepreneur to thrive. Thank you. 
Do you want to have a word? I just want to make a small point. I mean, I think first to just <coughs> commend you and, and others who are investing, I think, in young people. I would just say that the young people, and again, I just want to talk about what we see. We see about 10,000 young people a month uh, who come to Harambee. None of them are entitled. Actually, these are young people who, despite the odds, are still finding a way to try to look for work. Most of them have been searching for work for between one to three years, trying entrepreneurship programs, trying other things. So the, the irony is when people say, I want grit and I want resilience and I want this and I want... If you wake up every day doing something when every door gets slammed in your face and you can keep doing that year and year and year, I would argue that that would be a good indicator of grit and resilience. Yeah. And so I think we just have to just, I think we have to be careful because there are a wide variety of young people who face very different challenges. And the question is how to catch the ones that we can where they are with all kinds of programs and interventions and just try to keep them moving forward as best we can. Thank you. Can we go right in front of him? Thank you. Um, one question, two parts. Um, so, help me to understand the, the, the models and, and the thinking that you rely upon. How, how are, are they informed by the multi-generational nature of the audiences that you are appealing to? So, I'm referring to the unique um, expectations, mindsets of your Gen Y, in your Gen Z, so your, your, your Gen Y are typically your uh, instant uh, gratification seekers. Your Gen Zs are the ones who have come in on the, on the tail end of the previous um, economic recession, so, so they tend to be more appreciative of economic hardship and would go without things. So that's the first part of the question. Second part of the question, how, how, how do you believe the, the failure curve can be flattened through the use of rapid prototyping, both in the service and the production side of things. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Professor Nena, do you have a response to that? I'd like to think about it. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Sure. So, I mean, if I can take a stab at your first question. So your first question just talks to, I guess, the... Uh, the diversity, I guess, of people from of generations within the workplace, and I think, um, and and so, and I'd like to even go further than just the generations, but also, um, and I guess your generations includes men and women. So if you look at the inclusion of women in the workplace, it was based on war. There was war, and men went to fight, and there were gaps in the in the workplace, and and that's how women were introduced into formal, into formal workforce. Um, and now, because I guess, and the, the dynamics with, with the different generations is you have, you have the older generations, as you said, who are more sticky, they'll typically stick to one or two jobs for a lifetime. They're more appreciative of hardship. And then you have the youngsters who are more kind of, um, who will probably have four to five jobs kind of in, in their lifetime, or probably even more. Um, so what does that and, and, and I think an entrepreneurial culture within within a workforce so I don't I don't see entrepre entrepreneurship as just as just um, kind of something outside of formal formal employment how I see it is the companies that will thrive in the workplaces that will thrive um, and even entrepreneurial situations that will thrive because you need a mix of that it talks to diversity um, you need guys who are quick thinking, who, who know what to, what to achieve, and, and you need guys who think more, think the process out and everything. And so you get a mix of that. So what you, what you want is in terms of, in terms of, in terms of coexistence, and that's, and that's what I touched on in terms of the future worker in the workforce, is that you'll have to be appreciative, both, both generations will have to be appreciative of each other. Uh, and where each other come from, as opposed to imposing a certain way. So now, in terms of being ready for the workplace of tomorrow, it's not the organization that's dictating to you what you should be like, but you're actually, you're actually learning about everyone else and saying, how do we then work together to kind of, to be a lot more productive? Um, even with robots, um, uh, what what is automated and what is what is being done by robots and how do we leverage that for increased productivity? Because at, at the end of the day, why are we working? 
right? Other than the wealthy people who are doing what they really want to do, most people are working because they want to earn a living and they want to be able to get to that point where they can really do what they want to do. So now if you understand why you really are working and you understand what it is, what could translate into success, then we need to have the maturity to understand the different people in the system that will make that success a reality. And it's that appreciation, I think, that will make us work better together. Thank you. Um, Mok, there's a question over there at the back. That hand. You're sitting in the dark. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good afternoon, guys. Uh, look, with the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, you have, you know, uh, blockchain and crypto currencies. <coughs> Sorry. If you take two steps back, right, we realize that uh, the sovereignty of each country is mostly underpinned by the country's ability to control its, say for example in South Africa, the rent. Do you think that the Reserve Bank would welcome cryptocurrencies which they can control with two hands? Given that they can control the rent, would they allow, say, your cryptocurrencies to come and replace the rent which they can control. Thank you. Okay, we're going to skip, skip to uh, another question immediately. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. Sorry, excuse me. Would you bring it over there, please? Yeah. This hand here that's been up yes. for a long time. Um, my question is very specific, so I'll just get to... I'm not going to talk in the abstract sense. One of the people that are often... Um, purported to be the people that are going to be the entrepreneurs in South Africa is the graduates. Um, it, and I think given the fact that we're at a university, my question is how do you incentivize graduates to start businesses in the face of a high risk of failure um, that's presented to them at graduation? How do you present entrepreneurship as a viable option if you don't have much resources versus a low unemployment rate, a high return on uh, private return on education, and so forth. Thank you. And then we're going over there, yes. I okay. really can't see anything up there yeah. in the dark. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I just want to hatch on to what Professor Nene said about transforming and creating an entrepreneurial university, which actually may be, may be part of the answer of the last question. Uh, Professor Nene talked about resources for startups, entrepreneurship education, and funding through venture capitalists and angel investors. Uh, I teach entrepreneurship and small business management. I think my colleague Anna Marie is also here. Now, we are faced with the problem of uh, teaching these modules as theory and not practical because of some of the hinders we have in the university. For example, at the end of the first semester, we had students present projects, business plans. We had great business plans. But what do we do with those business plans? We could identify five of the best business plans. But then if we talk about bringing angel investors, if we talk about bringing a venture capitalists to actually sponsor these business plans for the students to actually put it to practice, we are faced with red tapes from the U university. I'm also happy that the vice dean is here as well of our faculty. Uh, we are talked of red tape. They tell us uh, who is going to own the IP, how much of it is going to come to business management and the university. But these are projects that the University of Johannesburg actually does successfully. So we talk about training our youths but we don't give them a safe space here at the university to actually put into practice the theory that we are teaching them in class. In less than two weeks, we are going to start the second phase of the module, which is small business management. And we have great ideas in which we want to give our students maybe seed capital 
for them to actually run a real life project. And at the end of the semester, we would then evaluate to see, did you make profits? Did you make losses? What challenges did you face? But we are told by management that it is not possible to do that. So we want to know how is it that other universities like UJ can actually do it, but we can't do it. We need to teach our students not just the theory, but practical as well. Then lastly, I want to also commend Danny for what he's doing. My daughters really love uh, Entrepreneurship Club at St. Michael's. They are eight and 10 years old, and they talk about target market, they talk about logo, they talk about marketing, so many things that I only learned in university. So well done, it's a very good project, and truly entrepreneurship starts at a very young age. So um, hopefully uh, we can discuss this as a department and faculty with top management, how we can implement these strategies so that we actually make it a practical module for our students and not just theoretical. Thank you. Thank you for that contribution. Um, we can take two more questions and then I'm going to just say let's have concluding remarks. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Um. Okay, sorry. Thank uh, you. Good day, panel. I would like to ask firstly to David, and then I've got another question. So, David, I want to ask you, as you saw your your search, what your result came from the search you did, and most reports are given, they're assuming that accountants' jobs are most at risk. So I want to ask you how you better equipping yourself as a person inside accountancy and is working at a banking firm, how do you better equip yourself that to ensure that you're not at risk for these AIs to take your position and to still be employed? And my other question to the panel is, as a postgrad student who's applying for jobs and you always get these rejections, you get no, no, because everything's done on paper. All they know is about on paper. They want you to have 65% average, which you understand, makes sense. But there's other parts that you don't understand why they judge you on paper. So now you look, before you apply for a job, you're going to look if the objectives and the goal of that company suits you as a person. Now, you see it suits you as a person, but they reject you because of what's based on paper. And then, as myself, who studied investment banking, but I've got an entrepreneurial mind. I want to be an entrepreneur, but I've been put in an economy where I need to first study investment banking to probably get a job first. Then I can go and start my own entrepreneurship. Now I want to ask, how do I better myself as a postgrad to actually get this position in the company that's rejecting me the whole time, but I meet the 65% average and everything, but they're rejecting me because of all the other tests that they're doing. But I've actually got the personality, the heart, as you said at the end of your presentation, the personality, the hands-on and everything to actually work for that company, to strive in a way that's going to better me and equip myself better at the company, then afterwards get all those you know, hands-on, that intelligent and equip myself better to start my own entrepreneur things to better help with the growth within the economy of Africa and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Is there one last burning question or can we go? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, please. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I just want to comment actually on saying that this is very good, but the lady said it very clear that where are the youth that we're talking about? Um, if this can start in the primary school whereby children, like the model that the, lady, the second lady was talking about, because uh, be able to be picked up at that time, we wouldn't have questions like what that guy just asked right now or what everybody's saying now. Resilience and being able to be picked up while the child is still doing all the initiative. To cut the whole story, I'm actually from iDestiny and that's what we are actually trying to do in the free state from this year. What we are trying to do is that we have asked Alan Grain, we go to primary, primary schools, not even high school, not anything. We are looking for the children in grade six who are actually having the entrepreneurship um, character, if I may say it like that, and the teachers are starting to help us with that. And then it comes to what the lady has just said at the back. The top five of the children who are actually doing well then we work them through, and at least the child is already knowing that by grade six, I will be studying, but my ending point is I want to be an entrepreneur. So all I'm asking is, even the university is actually an appeal to the university, that if maybe we can just all work together, that you go out there and then you search them before they even get here. <laughs> you go to high schools, you go to, people think that everybody that is so intelligent is actually from, uh, towns and all of that. What about the rural schools? What about the entrepreneur in a farm school that is out there? So uh, it's just an appeal that 
even for the university themselves, for the CSI, their community project, can we just all now starting to go there to the farm schools and to all of that so that this economy that we are so worried about of South Africa, maybe the young people who are still in primary can actually make the difference. Thank you. I hope you are okay with it that we go over time a little bit. But the, the contributions from the floor have been so brilliant uh, that I think we should entertain one last one before we come to the panel. There was a hand here in front. Oh, there. Can you keep it trying? You know, we're already five minutes over time and we still have to get back to the panel. So please be short right. and sweet. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lasejo and I'm from Black Management Forum. Um, I think the role of the incubators and incubations, accelerators, um, as it relates to enterprise development is very crucial in the subject. Um, this is a business school next door. And what is the role of a business sector in terms of intertwining it uh, as it relates to practicalities of business? It's one thing that we really have to talk about here. Uh, it, it has to, this theory thing, without being practical and pragmatic, is not okay. Uh, you cannot say, I want to be an entrepreneur. You are an in entrepreneurship, in a, it's a practical thing. You start now, you learn in a process. And I, for myself, I come from the incubation. Unfortunately, incubations have been placed into TVET colleges. Um, what about universities? Uh, do we have companies that are here? Let's say, for instance, uh, Itau or Sparta that says uh, this is the sum of money that we given to this university to develop entrepreneurship and to give seed funding to this kind of people. Uh, those are issues that we really have to talk about. We have to talk about policies, youth enterprise strategy plans, uh, youth set aside, those things we have to really embark on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, can we go to the panel and get concluding remarks? Can we start with you, Professor Nana? I think I'll firstly like to thank everyone who made very valuable comments, and I take to it that everything you've said is important. And before I conclude, I think I have two things to say. And the first comment is going to be, knowledge without action is meaningless. And secondly, the graveyard happens to be the richest place. So. If you have that idea and you don't try to do anything about it, when you die, it's going to stay there. And having said that, when you look at the current regulatory environment in South Africa, and we take into consideration the red tapes and everything, we need the government to come on board. But why they do that? You as a person, that action is not just saying, I have an idea, I want to be. You have to put it into action. So now, what are the best practices we can learn from the people already in business? What is it about them that they have that is standing out that we can learn from them? Because while we're waiting for the government, it could take today, it could take tomorrow, it could take 10 years. So if you want to see the economy grow, we, the people with the ideas who have to come on board to say, in spite of the things that are going wrong, how do I develop a proactive personality? How do I develop the resilience I need to strive in a difficult environment like the one we have there? And of course, entrepreneurship needs to be taught too, from the primary up to all levels, so, and that needs that it's, we talk about the industry university partnership, we need some sort of collaborations. And looking again at the UFS, if I say this and I don't say it, then I don't think I've concluded. We see a lot of things happening from the CDS, from the DLD, you see that everyone is doing their own thing and it's not speaking to each other. So it's about time that we have a one-stop shop here at the university where we come, the students come from information to everything they need. And I'm again, I'm going to add to, to say lastly, we need, Firstly, we, I don't, I'm not for the policy of giving incentives, and I'm telling you, I discourage that. If you want to start an entrepreneur, tell me what you have. Because when, you, I, give, when I give you 100% funding, it means, firstly, you depend on me. If the business does not succeed, then you haven't lost anything. But the fact that you put in your own personal finance, it means that you're willing to be an entrepreneur. So policies to me aiming at saying you're given funding, I discourage it. But however, funding should be given at specific stages within the business life cycle. And that should be from a need-to-need -need basis. And then again, that is how the program should be tailored. At the varsity year, we're teaching entrepreneurship. My colleague from that side teaches that class, but the truth is, I've, I've also given that class. And we have students who come from the sciences with already a prototype and everything. And that class is not meant for them. 
So we need to be, we need to ensure we offer tailored specific programs to different set of students. If you want to teach students about forming and intentions here, yeah, then you can do it at UFS 101. But if you already have ideas, then they are not for that class. So I think that when we, we need to have an, we need to go back to the drawing board and think clearly. Who is our target market with respect to these programs? What is the need? How do we ensure that we give them the practical side and the theory side so they can be successful? Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. I, th I think just to echo, um, thank you for all the contributions. I'll just make three brief points. I know we're sure. short on time. Um, I think the first is that there's been a lot of commentary about what makes the entrepreneur. And I guess I would just caution that that really requires science and data and research and not assumptions. And if I, I just give a very practical example, to be a good salesperson, people think you have to be an extrovert. That has nothing to do with being a good salesperson. It's your ability to deal with rejection and your confidence to keep going. It's not about can you approach people mm -hmm. and be an extrovert. So I think we must just be careful that we understand entrepreneurship and the what is the entrepreneur in a way that's, I think, really data-driven and informed by research and informed by what actually is the case and not making assumptions. And that really, I think, talks to the second point, which was the last comment that was made, is I actually think one of this country's greatest assets is the vitality of our people and the potential of young people to do so many things that we don't believe they can do. And I see that they can do it. We see it every day in the work that we do. How do we measure that potential in a way that is, what can you do? Not what's on paper, not what did you study, not where did you grow up, but what can you do? And if we can give more young people a chance to show what they can do, I genuinely believe the opportunities for not just job creation, but all these pathways into developing new ideas and doing new things are absolutely possible. The last point, which was to the investment banker, what, what can you do? The only thing I wanna say is um, about five years ago, I sat on a panel with the CEO of AdCorp. And he said on that panel that 12% of all jobs in South Africa are advertised. 88% of people get jobs that are not even the pieces of paper you're looking at, right? So how do you think about the networks? And we all have networks. We think other people have networks. We all have networks of who we know, how we start to understand what people's needs are, because most jobs emerge from somebody realizing they have a need, not necessarily posting a job description. And so I would urge you to think about how to use your networks beyond just responding to what's, um, what's being advertised. Thank you. David? Sure. Um, just, I guess, from my side, I just want to, again, reiterate um, <clears throat> the environment. So an enabling environment makes a success of a lot of things. So from government to universities to um, having incubators and everything. Um, so that's, that's very important. And I'd also like to talk about value proposition. So once you have an enabling environment, you need to uh, have a value proposition to make it work. Now, just how, how do I stay relevant? I have a value proposition. So if I come knock on your door for a job or for anything else, I need to let you know why it's worthwhile for you to actually uh, pay any attention to me or want me to work with you or to want to, want to work with me. Um, without that value proposition, I'm at your mercy and you, I'm wanting you to do me favors based on me being a nice guy as opposed to you actually needing what I have to offer. And that also talks to entrepreneurship. Um, when you develop a product or a service, it needs to have a strong value proposition. Without that value proposition, all you're doing is knocking on doors for favors. Um, because when you need funding and when you need support and when you need offtake of your product or service, someone needs to know that they're actually backing something that is reliable and something that will actually add value to, to them and to what they need. If you are able to develop that value proposition, a strong one at that, you will be able to withstand any, any shakes in the market or any uh, uh, obstacles that, that come your way because you get to a point where you build a brand where that sells itself. Um, and, then, and then just um, lastly, just on, on I guess, because um, uh, entrepreneurship is, 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 quite a, is quite a strong theme here. And Entrepreneurship requires funding. It needs money to become a success. Now, um, it's it's all well and good. It's all well and good to understand theory and to be taught theory, but you need to also understand how to again not only sell your product, but to understand all the different facets of of business and what makes it work. Um, 
experience is very important. So if you go knocking on, on someone's door for funding, they'll ask who you are. Um, if you go on any company's website, even the biggest companies in the world, there's always an about us or who are we tab on their website. You need to be able to develop that, to develop yourself to a point where you have a profile that is credible enough for someone to want to be able to back you. Now, what does that mean? It could mean working with an incubator. It could mean influencing the university to actually help you gain that requisite experience that you need, as opposed to, so we're in a society now where learning is not just one way. Learning is two ways. So you should be able to influence the university, to influence corporate, to influence government. There's a lot of entrepreneurs in here. I don't know to what extent the entrepreneurs in here or the entrepreneurial bodies actually interact with the department of, the, of, of SME for instance, right? Whereas that is the key to unlock an, an environment that could work for entrepreneurs, right? Is to understand what are my levers of success and how do I pull that? And to ensure that when that opportunity comes, how do I make sure that I'm ready for that opportunity that comes my way? And that's being able to have a profile that serves your purpose when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you.